Hi, uh, I'm really thrilled to be a part of this discussion. I've been uh, looking forward to this meeting for a long time, actually, and the discussions that will take place today. Uh, my name is Elliot Harmon. I'm an activist with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, my colleague Daniel Nazer is an attorney with EFF, and you'll, you'll be hearing from him later this afternoon. Um, we are here kind of representing a campaign that we launched several months ago called Reclaim Invention. And to put this maybe in a little bit of perspective of our strategy as an organization, um, we kind of see this as the latest front in really a lot of work that we've been doing over a lot of years having to do with the patent system. And what we see as flaws in the system and the way in which the system is kind of uh, works in practice that put uh, innovative practicing companies at a disadvantage, particularly in high-tech areas that are particularly fertile for innovation uh, and puts aggressive patent assertion entities at an unfair advantage. Um, and the issue of how that plays out in universities and tech transfer is something that we've done a little bit of thinking and writing about over the years, but uh, about a year ago we decided that it was time to start investing a little more energy in it. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about this too much because Yarden already kind of walked through this. Uh, this is the, the universities with the most patents in the intellectual ventures portfolio. Um, and even just looking at this, I'm uh, reminded again of the issue of representation of the public universities. And um, I'm, I'm glad that there are some perspectives of people who have worked in the public university sphere here. Um, uh, also, another point I was going to make about this, and somebody can correct me later if I'm mistaken about this, but my understanding is that this is of the 30,000 uh, patents that IV publicly lists on its portfolio. Uh, so there are a number that are under exclusive licenses that have not been disclosed that are not part of these numbers. But even within those 30,000 that are in its public portfolio, 500 of those originating from universities is a striking number. Um, and this is a slightly different set of data uh, because this is patents from universities in the U.S. period as opposed to specifically NIH-funded ones, but you get the same idea. Um, looking at this graph, it would be very easy to tell, even if you knew nothing about this space, when the Bayh-Dole Act passed. And so we will, we'll, we'll talk about that more in a couple of minutes. But this graph is very interesting to me for another reason. And this is kind of bringing in some of my background in the open access world. When you look at this graph, it's so interesting to think about it in the context of other developments that have happened in science over the same period of time. And the kind of explosion of open access uh, research. And now we're at this point where essentially all federal government funded science in the United States is, is under an open access policy requiring it to be made available to the public after an embargo period. And many, many foundations are moving in that direction, adopting open access policies as well, many of which are more aggressive than the government policies. And so it struck me as this odd paradox that over uh, the last 10, 15 years, we've moved more and more toward this federally funded research being available to the public to read, to build on, to incorporate into their businesses. But at the very same time, universities are patenting more aggressively than ever on that same body of research. And at least some of those patents are ending up in the hands of companies that don't necessarily have the public's best interests at heart. It almost seems to me like this kind of massive game of whack-a-mole we're playing, in which we've just managed managed to push back this one sort of threat to another interest, and it sort of popped back in our faces in a different form. Um, so again, that's why we decided to launch this campaign, Reclaim Invention, and the kind of the official launch of this was about eight months ago, but it was really the uh, culmination of conversations that we'd been having over a long time and are continuing to have. Uh, it essentially consists of two components. Uh, one is that we are calling on every research university in the U.S. to adopt a policy that says that it will not knowingly sell or license its patents to PAEs. Uh, and then it goes on to say that when evaluating uh, whether, whether to partner with a certain company, it will look at the history of that company and take a good faith effort to see whether it has a history of litigation that looks like patent trolling. Um, 
We created a petition so that people could petition their universities to sign this pledge. This was kind of a new thing for us. We'd never done something quite like this before. Uh, and now you can see the, I think it's about 5,000 now people that have, that have signed this petition. And it's kind of interesting. You can split it up by institution. So you can go to reclaiminvention.org slash Harvard and, and, and see how many people with Harvard University have, have called on Harvard to adopt this pledge. The other half of the campaign is this piece of model state legislation that we wrote, which is called the Reclaim Invention Act. Uh, this does some of the same things and some slightly different things, but specifically focused on state university systems within a state. So what this model text that we wrote does is, one, uh, it requires state-funded universities to adopt a policy not to sell or license to PAEs, and two, it voids the sale of any uh, state university patent to a PAE. This was an interesting exercise for us to put this together because it was the first time that we had to kind of find a legal definition of PAE that we were comfortable with. Uh, and we looked at how some other organizations had dealt with this issue and how some existing legislation had, had dealt with it to arrive at a definition that we were more or less happy with. So according to this definition, a PAE is an entity whose primary business model is based on patent assertion or otherwise using patents to obtain licensing fees from practicing companies, which I think is a pretty good working definition. This is actually a more conservative definition than, than, than some of the more kind of informal definitions of PAEs or trolls. Um, and I think it works well in this context in that it makes it clear that it's not talking about a practicing company that is also asserting its, its patents, so long as the underlying business model is actually about using the invention and it is not about litigation. So we launched this campaign about eight months ago, and a couple of interesting things have happened since then. Um, one is that there's been a lot of attention to this, particularly around like law school students in our network. There's a group of students at the University of Texas that are pushing on this issue very hard and trying to uh, get UT to adopt a policy. Um, We've also gotten a, f a f handful of state legislators uh, reaching out to us and kind of wanting to talk with us more about our model state legislation. It has been introduced thus far in one state that we know of, and that's Maryland, but we certainly hope to see, uh, we hope to see states addressing this issue uh, in an ongoing way, uh, use it, using our language if it seems to be appropriate for their context. We've also succeeded at annoying some people. Um, this is a relatively representative example of the kind of pushback that we got. This is an op-ed that uh, Richard Epstein wrote for Forbes. Uh, and I kind of I love this line, despite myself, uh, that it's foolish for universities to sacrifice patent revenues in order to satisfy the aesthetic whims of the EFF. Um, I think that that's, that's a very funny way of thinking. And like I said, this is representative of some of the other pushback we received as well. Um, because it seems to kind of elevate revenue above, indeed, the reasons why tech transfer offices exist. That if there is a license that is not compatible with the mission of the organization, then that's not sacrificing revenue. That's simply carrying out the mission of the organization. Um, Daniel made the point that you could kind of apply the same logic to financial aid programs, uh, which are also sacrificing revenue uh, in order to fulfill the aesthetic whims of people who think that access to education is important. I'm I'm so glad to have gotten to speak after the two people who spoke earlier because they gave such you know, eloquent descriptions of what the purposes of these programs are. Um, so I know that this simplistic definition is something that a lot of people in this room would take issue with. We also, of course, whenever we uh, talk about uh, limitations, either voluntary or, or statutory on uh, university licenses. Of course, this always brings up the specter of the Bayh-Dole Act, and a number of people have talked to us about the Bayh-Dole Act. And this is kind of maybe the thought that I will sort of end with for now, is that I think it's very, very dangerous to think of Bayh-Dole as a trump card that kind of sh shuts down these discussions. Um, and uh, in fact, it's To do so is to miss both the purpose and, I think, the language of the law itself. 
uh, the law says it is the policy and objective of Congress to use the patent system to promote the utilization of inventions arising from federally supported research or development. Uh, and that's a purpose that I strongly question whether it's ever compatible with the idea of, of licensing to PAEs. And it even goes on even more specifically in the law to give preference to small businesses having equal or greater likelihood as other applicants to bring the invention to practical application within a reasonable time. Um, which again, if you're looking at a company whose business model does not in any way involve bringing an invention to practical application, I question whether this can ever actually be achieved by licensing to a PAE. Um, and I'm, like I said, I'm looking forward to the rest of the discussions. My slides are there. They are on uh, Google Docs. Uh, if you're not comfortable using Google Docs, email you and I will send you a PDF. Thank you very much.